This is FRM Part 1, Book 3, Financial Markets and Products, Chapter 10, Swaps. I love talking about and studying derivative securities in general, but I really love talking about and studying swap contracts. And I always tell my students that the basis of a swap contract um, can be summarized by the following example. I tell students, I say, look, someday you're going to grow up and you're going to get a job and have a career. You're probably going to get married and you're probably going to have a house. And here living in Pennsylvania, you know, we get lots of snow in the, in the winter time. So I like to use this example. I say, look, you, know, you go out and you buy this big old snow blower. And when it snows 10 inches, you're out there snow blowing. But then you look across the street and you see your neighbor and he has this big old lawn mower that he put a blade on the front and he's got the lawn mower and he's driving out and he's pushing the snow and you're working really hard and you start to think you know what I, I'd rather have that than what I have and your neighbor's looking over there at you and saying boy I'd rather have that snow blower than my tractor and so this is really the nature of what the swap contracts are you're looking at somebody else somebody else's position and you're saying I want that so you give up something that you have. You give up your snowblower to get the John Deere uh, tractor. Now, of course, we're not swapping lawnmowers and snowblowers. We're swapping financial securities like an interest rate or uh, an option or um, a commodity or a currency. So swap contracts are really cool. Let me, let me see if I can convince you that they're also uh, pretty intuitive. Boy, this looks like lots of learning objectives here. So let me summarize these things. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about a plain vanilla interest rate swap. And that's exactly what the name suggests. I mean, it's plain and dull and vanilla, but it's, it's actually pretty cool. We're gonna look at how swaps can be used to transform an asset or a liability. So that's what I was talking about in the two driveways. Of course, we need financial intermediaries, we need confirmation. We'll talk about some um, comparative and absolute advantages. We'll view a swap as a simultaneous position in the fixed bond and a floating rate bond. We'll talk about currency swaps and a couple other things at the end. Let's take a look at a quick example of an interest rate swap. So instead of swapping the, the snowblower for the riding uh, the riding mower that has a blade on it to push the snow away, we're going to exchange one stream of interest payments for another. So an interest rate swap. And what this has to be is that we're going to swap a fixed payment for a floating payment. It makes no sense to swap a fixed payment for a fixed payment. Now, one of the coolest things about swaps is that there's, with the exception of currency swaps, there's no exchange of any kind of principle, either in the beginning or in the middle or in the end. So we need a specified principal amount. That's called the notional amount uh, of the swap contract. And just think of it as a reference amount. It could be a million, it could be 10 million, it could be 100 million. And of course, this is done over a specified period of time. Now, most swaps have uh, tenors of like three or five years, and then they are settled uh, every six months, mostly because bonds pay interest every six months. All right, so here's an example. And what I want you to do is think of yourself as either bank A or bank B. So forget about all the stuff in the middle here. Bank A is paying a fixed rate, and bank B is paying a floating rate. So here's the snowblower over here, and here's the, uh, the, the, riding, uh, the riding snow machine over here. We want to try to swap those. All right, so this is what Bank A does. Bank A says, you know what? I'm paying a fixed interest rate. What I would like to do is I would like to pay a floating rate. So Bank A picks up the phone and calls somebody and says, hey, I'm paying a fixed rate. Will you pay that fixed rate for me? And that person on the other end of the line is going to say, well, I'll go ahead and pay that fixed rate, but what do I get in return? And Bank A says, well, how about if I pay you a floating rate? Now, that other person on the end of the line is, of course, a financial institution, and it's probably someone called a swap dealer. That's why I have SD there in the middle. So I want you to think about the, the way these arrows go. 
what bank A does is says to the swap dealer, I want you to make my fixed payment for me. So that payment goes from the swap dealer over to bank A and then over to whoever bank A owes that fixed payment to. Maybe it's a bondholder, maybe it's another bank, right? And so in return then, the swap dealer receives uh, the floating rate, which is almost always based on the London interbank offered rate. You see how everything on that left side of the slide tells you that what bank A has done, it has turned a fixed rate loan into a floating rate loan. And of course, bank B does just the opposite. Bank B is paying the, uh, paying the floating rate. So bank B calls the swap dealer and says, hey, will you pay the floating rate for me? And the swap dealer says, sure, I'll make those payments for you. What do I get in return? And bank B says, hey, how about if I pay you something that is fixed? So notice bank B turns a floating rate loan into a fixed rate loan. And this is the beauty and the simplicity of swaps. Now, of course, the swap dealer in the middle is not gonna do this stuff for free. So let's do another slide that looks almost identical to that slide, but it has some numbers attached to it. So let's start over here at bank A. Let's suppose bank A is paying a fixed 5%. Bank B is paying a floating uh, rate of LIBOR plus 125 basis points. All right, so what's gonna happen is that bank A is gonna call the swap dealer and say, will you make my fixed payments for me? Now remember, bank A may have issued that bond or taken out that loan three years ago or five years ago or 50 years ago. So that fixed rate of 5% is tied to the loan at the time uh, that it was issued. The fixed rate in between the swap dealer and bank A, that's the fixed swap rate. And that's of course determined by current market rates. So, so it's not gonna be like bank A gets the swap dealer to make all of those payments. Now what bank A will do is just adjust the notional principle that specified principal amount to try to make those payments equal. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. So notice the swap dealer is going to pay 4.6% to uh, bank A, and then bank A is going to take all of that 4.6 and then make that 5% payment to its bondholders. In return, it's going to pay LIBOR plus 1.1%. Uh, now over for bank B, we do the same thing, except we, we flip it on its head. Bank B is going to receive LIBOR plus one and then have to pay LIBOR plus one and a half. So both bank A and bank B are not getting enough, right? Not getting enough from the swap dealer to meet its, uh, its fixed and its floating payments. But once again, it can adjust the notional principle uh, to try to make those two equal. And in return, bank B is going to pay a fixed rate to the swap dealer. Now, remember what I said here uh, on the last slide, the swap dealer doesn't do this stuff for free. And so notice that the swap dealer is receiving 4.7 from bank B and only paying 4.6 to bank A, receiving LIBOR 1 plus 1 or plus 1.1 and paying LIBOR plus 1%. So the swap dealer, of course, makes out on, on both ends. And and bank A and bank B are willing to pay that, you know, think of it as a bid-ask spread, think of it as some kind of swap spread, think of it as something like the cost of maneuvering so that each bank can obtain the loan that it wants. Now, here's kind of a summary of what we've been talking about here. Company A agrees to pay company B a fixed rate based on a notional, and I could go back here and say the notional of this is $10 million. So then all we would do is we would take the $10 million times the LIBOR plus one and a half percent, and then uh, the $10 million times uh, the 4.9%. And so in return, company B agrees to pay the periodic floating rate on, uh, on the same notional principle. Now, since both payments are in the same currency, only the net payment is exchanged. It makes no sense. Let me go back here really quickly. It makes no sense that bank B, uh, pay, bank B owes the swap dealer, let's say a million dollars, and the swap dealer owes bank B, let's say $1.1 million. It doesn't make sense for those two to, to, to exchange, so, so we just do netting. Now let's do a quick example with some math. 
Um, let's suppose at the bottom there, we're going to do a notional principle of 10 million and we're going to do six month semi-annual, uh, six month payments over a two year plain vanilla interest rate swap. Six month LIBOR is the reference rate and the fixed rate is 2.75%. All right. So let's go ahead and work through the math of here. Now, one of the one of the interesting parts about swap contracts is that the the rate at the beginning of the period will determine the payment at the end of the period. So that's why that first table I have beginning of the period 1 2 3 4 so that's, you know, time period 0 1 2 3, right? And then there's LIBOR. So it's t today we know that LIBOR is 2%. Now, we don't know what those other rates are, but let's just suppose that the LIBOR increases over the next two years from two to two and a half to three to three and a half. Okay, so at the end of period one, the LIBOR at the beginning of period was 2%. So 2% of that $10 million gives me 200,000, right? But since it's semi-annual, we cut that in half. So there's the floating uh, cash flow payment of $100,000 there somewhere in the middle, the fixed cash flow uh, is going to be fixed, right? It's 2.75% of 100, uh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. of 10 million. So you get 275, cut that in half. And there's the, there's the column of fixed cash flow of 137,500. All right. So notice that in the early part of this swap, the 137 is greater than the 100, and then it's greater than the 125, and then it's less than the 150 and less than the 175. So note what happens over here in the net cash flow. Uh, bank A has to pay the 37,500 and the 12,500 in those first two six month periods, but then B has to pay the 1250 and the 37,500 in the following two six month periods. And so just the way the math works here, you can see that, you know, you kind of A and B, they kind of break even, so to speak, you know, forget about the time value of money there. But of course, those net cash flows over in that second to the far right column depend on what LIBOR is. Of course, it depends on what LIBOR is. So LIBOR could have been, let's say, two and then eight and then one and then 12 and then zero, et cetera, et cetera. And so those payments can can flip flop over time. Now, here's a slide that tells us all about the, the swap dealers. So just like other over-the-counter instruments, uh, the swap parties do not interact with each other. Of course, if I'm swapping with my neighbor over there, I've got the, I've got the snowblower and he's got the John Deere tractor, we're going to interact with each other, right? We're going to go over and we're going to shake hands and say, here, you, can that, you have that and I'll have this. Uh, but of course, it doesn't happen on... Uh, in this over-the-counter swap market because there is a swap dealer in between. And so the swap dealer just writes separate contracts between uh, each two. And remember, the, the equity market is about this big and the swap market is about this big. So there's always somebody willing to come in and take over that position. Let's go ahead and spend a minute talking about comparative advantages. All right, so suppose we have two firms. A and B. Both of these companies have found positive net present value projects, and so they, they need to fund these positive net present value projects. Uh, they could issue a bond either in the fixed market or in the floating market. But note, according to this table, that uh, they are not exposed to the same types of borrowing rates. So if you look inside of the table, firm A can issue a fixed rate bond at 6% and a floating rate bond at LIBOR plus 100 basis points. Firm B, on the other hand, would have to pay a much higher fixed rate and a higher floating rate. All right, so clearly firm A has an absolute advantage in both markets. And upon first look, you might think to yourself that, oh, firm A holds all the cards, firm B is out of luck, right? Firm B, no matter what, is going to have to pay a higher interest rate. Well, but note that the difference in the fixed market is 2% and the difference in the floating market is just 1.5%. And, 
So B has some type of a comparative advantage. So can we use, can we use that comparative advantage to uh, benefit both parties, okay? So look down underneath the arrow and look at the second group of block points, right? So this is what's gonna happen. Uh, firm A is going to borrow at 6%. Firm B is going to borrow at LIBOR plus the two and a half percent. All right, makes perfect sense. Both of them are financing their positive net present value projects. Then they're going to enter a swap. Now what's going to happen is that B is going to agree to pay A a fixed rate of 7.75 percent. Because look up above the uh, look up above the table, A has this absolute advantage. But A prefers to issue a floating rate bond, and B, just conveniently, prefers to issue a fixed rate bond, okay? Maybe A believes that interest rates are going to fall, and B believes that interest rates are going to rise. Remember, economists for both of these firms, uh, they're never going to agree with each other. All right, so what do we have here? We have A borrowing at six, B borrowing at LIBOR plus two and a half, then they're going to enter a swap. What's going to happen is that B is going to pay A 7.75% and A is going to pay B the LIBOR plus the two and a half percent. Now at first glance you might be thinking, wait a minute Jim, I'm not quite sure how this works, but let's go ahead and do the net payments. So what's happening with, uh, with A? A is receiving 7.75 from B and then paying off its bondholders at 6%. So it is, it is gaining 1.75%, right? And then it is agreeing to pay LIBOR plus 2.5%. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna take that 1.75% to offset the plus 2.5% next to the LIBOR. So it's net payment, look out there uh, on the right-hand side of the equal sign, is gonna be LIBOR plus 0.75%. Now the net payments for B, notice what it's doing. It's paying the floating and it's receiving the same floating so those two cancel out. So it's just paying 7.75% uh, to A. So notice what's happening here. Because of this comparative advantage that B holds over A in that floating market, notice that B gets to borrow at its preferred fixed rate, but not 8%. Now it only gets has to pay 7.75%. A gets to pay in its preferred floating rate market, but instead of having to pay LIBOR plus 1%, it only has to pay LIBOR plus 0.75%. So notice, notice that there's 25 basis points advantage going to both A and B. Now you tell me that's not cool. So moving on to this comparative advantage argument conclusion, how did I know, here, let me flip back here, how did I know that each party was going to benefit by 25 basis points? Well, there's the savings, this good formula there at the top. So we're going to do uh, the difference in the fixed minus the difference in the floating. So that's 200 basis points, right? So that's 8 minus 6 is 2% on the fixed side and then uh, 150. So what's that? So 200 LIBOR plus 100 and LIBOR plus 250. So that difference is uh, that difference is 150. So there's a 50 basis point possibility of savings, and if we evenly chop that in half, we get 25 basis points on both sides. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be evenly split, uh, but for argument's sake here, it's it's uh, provides us with a much simpler example. Now, this comparative advantage argument assumes that. Uh, the floating rates will remain o over the long term. Um, of course, floating rate is observed at six month intervals and may increase or decrease to reflect the credit risk of the borrower. And another problem is there are zero transaction costs here. So think about, think about this, that uh, you know, there's no way that these two firms who specialize in whatever product lines that these two positive net present value projects are involved in, they probably don't know a whole lot about how to arrange a swap contract. Remember, it's a contract legal and binding document. 
And so uh, comparative advantage works sometimes and, and sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, the math is cool. Um, now, what's happening here in this swap is let, let's do let's look at a, a five year tenor. So we've got we've got five years, but every six months we we uh, net the payments. So that's ten possible netting of payments. So it's really a series of cash flows. Now, of course, if we enter this swap today and uh, we're we're paying the floating rate and all of a sudden rates rates spike and we think wait a minute we we think rates might continue to spike we don't want to continue paying that higher floating rate we could get out of it so what we need to do is value that swap in between those those settlement dates well of course the way that we're going to compute the value of the swap is by is by taking its present value now, when we take present value, are we going to use spot rates or are we going to use forward rates? And here's, here's the good formula for the relationship between forward rates and spot rates. So that forward rate is going to be equal to the corresponding spot rate. We'll call that R2. And then we're going to add to that the R2 minus the R1. So think about when we talked about that spot curve in a previous chapter, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the sum of that first forward rate, uh, I'm sorry, that first spot rate, and then add the difference between the two, and then we're weighting it by time over there in the far right. Now, what we're going to do then is we're going to use those rates to compute, to compute the value of the swap. And this really is just looking at a swap as if as if you have as if you have a position in two bonds all right so look at those first two block points uh, the pay fixed party has a long position in the floating rate bond and a short position in the fixed rate bond because we're worried about inflows and outflows on the other hand the pay floating party has a short position in the floating rate and a long position in the fixed rate remember uh, if you're if you're paying the floating rate if you're the pay floating leg you're hoping that interest rates go down if you're the pay fixed leg you're hoping that interest rates go up all right so there are two good formulas in the middle of the page there the value of the swap if we're paying fixed and receiving floating you have the minus and the, and the pluses on on either side now let me take one uh, one small comment here that to compute the um present value of the floating rate bond is relatively easy because remember that the floating rate bonds are that coupon rate is set to equal the yield to maturity on the bond at that payment date so the bond is going to sell for its par value right and so all you have to do is discount it back you know however many days uh, less than six months so that part is relatively easy the fixed part is a little bit more complex because you're getting those fixed payments what did i say over a, a five-year period so you're getting 10 of those things and so you have to compute the present value of 10 of those coupon payments and then the and then the one thousand dollar or par value whatever you're using a thousand or a hundred dollars so the present value of the fixed computation is just a little bit more complex Now, a currency swap is exactly like a plain vanilla interest rate swap with one gigantic exception. The fact that a currency swap is a swapping of amounts in different currencies, there has to be an exchange of the notional amount or an exchange of the principal. So what happens is that at the inception of the swap, and let's go back to firm A and firm B, let's suppose we have a US firm and a Canadian firm, and let's just for argument's sake, say the value of those two, do uh, two dollars is equal. So one US dollar equals one Canadian dollar. So if each borrows a uh, hundred million in each currency, it's going to swap those principal amounts. Now, then it's going to agree, it's going to agree to exchange those intermediate currency payments, right? Uh, 
over three or five years. And so those payments are going to be determined on those notional principles that, that were exchanged. Now, the interesting thing about a currency swap is that you, you could do a you could do a fix for floating or or you, you could you could arrange it uh, uh, several other ways. But there, there could be uh, different kinds of floating in there if you have multiple currencies. But anyway, just think of it as the same thing as a plain vanilla interest rate swap where we're doing a fixed for a floating. Currency swaps use the spot exchange rate and then uh, at the end, at the end, uh, those notional or the principal amounts are again are again swapped. And of course, there can't be any netting of payments because um, if I'm if I'm paying the Canadian dollar and receiving the U.S. dollar, those are apples and peaches, and so uh, and so there's no netting of payments. That should make perfect sense. Uh, a couple of quick examples here: these currency swaps can transform a liability. Uh, in one currency to a liability in a different currency, and and it can transform an investment in one currency into an asset in another currency. And so remember back here, let me just swing back here really, really quickly, uh, all the way here. So if you look at if you look at Bank A, what Bank A has essentially done is turned a fixed rate bond into a floating rate bond. And B has done just the opposite. So if I come back here, I hope I'm not giving you vertigo by going there too quickly. What you can do is you can do the same kind of a thing here. You can convert balance sheet kinds of items into other balance sheet kinds of items in different currencies. Now, this occurs, of course, because if, if going back to our example, firm A and firm B, if one had uh, that comparative advantage in the fixed or floating market, it makes even more sense that countries, uh, companies in the U.S. are going to be able to borrow in the U.S. at a lower rate than they would if they had to go to Canada to borrow. So there's probably more comparative advantages in this currency market. So here's a quick example. Firm X can borrow in uh, dollars at 6% or in pounds at 4%. Firm Y can borrow in dollars at 4.5% or in pounds at 3.2%. And so, you know, just take the difference between those two. And then both of these, both of these are going to be able to save on their borrowing costs. Um, and this is the result of comparative advantages. And then they'll swap in their preferred currencies. Now, there are lots of other kinds of swaps. Some of these things are really, really cool. An equity swap is, is fascinating. I mean, what you can do is you can swap like a fixed dividend payment for a floating rate payment, and that floating rate payment could be the return on uh, the S&P 500 index or a specified portfolio of well-diversified stocks or just an individual stock. And so think about what you're doing. You're swapping a fixed dividend payment for the return on the S&P 500 index. Now, if you're paying, if you're paying the, uh, if you're paying the, the fixed, right, you're paying the fixed, so that's going out. And if you're receiving the return on the index, you have to worry about if the index falls in value from one, uh, one quarter to another. These equity swaps uh, go quarterly because, uh, well, there's really no reason for them to go semi-annually because it's an equity, so we do these quarterly. Um, but you could lose on both ends of an equity swap, and that's really, really kind of interesting. Um, uh, an option on a swap uh, is just like the options that we've talked about. What do we know about an option? It gives the owner the right, but not the obligation to either buy or sell an asset, right? A swaption gives the owner the right, but not the obligation to enter an interest rate swap. And they can have the right to enter the interest rate swap as the pay fixed or the pay floating. Now, of course, you have to pay for an option. Remember, these are not free. And so there's going to be a strike rate or an exercise rate. And then there are commodity swaps. I mean, we could swap the return on wheat for the return on corn or the return on oil for the return on gasoline or anything, you know, in these commodity swaps. 
And that takes us through chapter 10.